Hi everyone, and welcome to the Gama Sutra Twitch channel. My name is Brian Francis, coming to you uh, from the deepest, darkest depths of the internet. Um, and by that I mean Los Angeles, California. Um, we are here today playing a game you may recognize called Fortnite. Specifically, Fortnite Battle Royale. And in the lower left-hand corner of the screen, I am joined by two wonderful faces. Alex, first of the faces. Who are you? Why have you invaded my stream? And uh, how does your cardigan feel today? That's a question I ask myself every day, Brian. Uh, if you're in the bowels of the internet in LA, am I in the heart of the internet here in the Bay Area? Is that how that works? I guess, yeah. I'm in the lower intestine. Nice. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Where we make the content. Right. Well, luckily, we're not the only ones stuck here. We have a very special guest here today. You didn't answer Brian. my questions. Oh, uh, I don't know. I uh, uh, How do I feel about cardigans? Cardigans are fine. Cardigans are okay. Are you? Uh, oh, I'm an editor at GamaSutra.com. Sweet. Uh, I guess I haven't been around for a while. Sorry about that. I'm back on the internet, and uh, it's good to be here. But more importantly, we have a very special guest. Very special guest. Would you tell everyone who you are and what you do? Sure. Uh, my name is Ben Lewis Evans. I'm uh, the lead UX researcher at Epic Games, where we work on Fortnite, amongst other things. Mm. Nice. I think, uh, Brian, you're playing Fortnite Battle Royale, the free-to-play mode of uh fortnite right yep just uh trying to pick my destination for jumping today uh ben any tips well you're right over tilted towers if you want a fast game go there i don't want a fast game i want to no. i want a winning game uh, i always want to win a game fair warning i'm gonna die a lot oh no the the joystick's inverted i didn't fix that i've been mm. playing on pc so um so thank you everyone for joining us today uh we are here today because uh not only is fortnite battle royales mode uh been something we've been keeping an eye on at got um you know we're interested in how it's grown uh what uh what advances epic has made in order to get this game off the ground we also uh ooh, looks like a little diner spot down here i'll drop in if uh -huh. anyone else is tomato town oh nope someone's coming okay nope running away Nice. Running or we bravely ran away away. Um yeah, so the we're here because uh Ben is giving a talk at GDC about this very game. Uh Ben, uh what is your talk and why should people attend it? Right. So uh, at GDC I'm not necessarily talking about Fortnite specifically. It it, mm -hmm. it will come up when examples are are appropriate, but I'm talking more generally about um the psychology of of human error in my past life when i was doing my phd and when i was uh, working in other industries i studied a lot of human factors psychology which is mm. the psychology of how people interact with technology uh, and as part of that there's a whole area dedicated to understanding why people make mistakes mm -hmm. so that's what i'm going to be talking about uh, for most of my talk going over what's call called the error classification mm -hmm. um but I think for games, and one of the things that makes working in user experience in games really interesting compared to, say, uh, traffic, where I used to work, mm -hmm. is that errors are actually a, a good thing in games. We don't want players uh, making errors where they feel bad, but we do want them to be challenged. We do want them to make mistakes mm -hmm. uh, where appropriate. So usually when I give this kind of talk, I would talk about uh, the types of errors and how to prevent them. But at GDC, I'm going to be also talking about how to use them. That's so, uh, Go for it, Alex. well, I'm so sorry because I know we're talking about video games here. We love video games, art, business, making them, selling them. It's great. But can you just tell me for a minute how you worked in traffic? Because that fascinates me. Sure. Uh, traffic psychology is a, a relatively old area of applied psychology now. And traffic deaths are kind of the leading cause of death worldwide, especially for young people. Mm. Um, so, most companies uh, and governments have traffic psychologists working for them and trying to understand uh, how to reduce that, how to improve traffic safety, how to change accessibility, uh, a lot of things like that. So that's the area it's looking at why accidents happen and what can be done to prevent that. Mm. So like, what is that gray area that you now have in games? that I presume you didn't have so much in traffic where, you know, there is room, you know, maybe not for frustrating failures, but for failures that like lead to interesting experiences or interesting uh, options in gameplay. Like, like how do you explore that area where um, you are trying to like facilitate the player's experience in the game, but not necessarily tell them everything they need to know to have a safe experience. Right. Yeah. And that, 
that can often be a, a common misconception about user experience or usability working games is that we're just there to make it easy for everybody. And you know, if we wanted to do that um, just now, uh, we got in combat and we died. Yep. Like mm -hmm. we could <laughs> win every get every time, right? You could be absolutely against AI that stands there and lets you shoot, but that's no fun. So, in my career in, in games user research, I've certainly uh, written game is too easy more than I've written game is too hard because it is important to find that balance of enough challenge that is intended versus stuff that's just coming because of hey uh, something's the wrong color or something's in the in a slightly uh, off place on the UI and that makes it difficult for players to see mm. yeah it, um, maybe we could talk just for a second for my own edification um, mm -hmm. sort of what you how you define your role as a UX um, sort of uh, specialist? Because you know we were talking about this before we started. Like the notion of uh, facilitating a, a good user experience is not new, but it seems like the the role of UX specialists and researchers in game design and development has become more pronounced in the last couple of years. And so I think maybe I'm not the only one who doesn't fully understand what specifically you see your role to be in the game development process. Like how do you come in and help the team um, just create a better game? Right. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, games user research as, as a field in games has been around. It was it was pioneered by Atari quite a while ago, but it didn't really become uh, big until a little bit later with Sony and Microsoft particularly leading the way. Um, as a games user uh, experience researcher, uh, my role and my team's role is to support the development team and to kind of make sure that their vision that they want the experience the players to have is the experience that players are having so we can uh usually we have backgrounds in human computer interaction or psychology we mm. uh, have good research methodology and we can get players in we can ask them questions and we can find out is that vision being delivered or not so like uh i know you you weren't involved with fortnite you know from the beginning um but maybe you can talk through some specific examples of how you were involved in sort of like uh, iterating upon this game's experience so that it could be a more streamlined process. Like, what did you do specifically on Fortnite, you and your team, to sort of like streamline everything and make it uh, better? Right. And, and again, I should say it's not necessarily about streamlining everything because there right. should be challenge, there should be things in the way, but it's, it's to make sure that those things aren't unintended. Um, so, an example, let's see, a good example of this looking at, at, at what's happening on the screen right now. Mm -hmm. is the c kind of feedback that's in uh, Fortnite Battle Royale and in Save the World. A, a lot of work make went into making sure that it was clear when you were taking damage. So just sliding <laughs> down that hill right now. Which was the, a bad idea. <laughs> the, the damage indicator clearly comes in, it flashes, it, it goes down. Uh, when you, you shot at that rock right then, it had a, had a bar on it that moves. And these things sound common sense, but it's important to make sure that they're actually coming across to players. So here's an example of, of one thing that maybe we've struggled with in Fortnite that's happening right now. Like, uh, are you aware of what that blue circle is when you're hitting it things vaguely when you're mining? I know it's vaguely like, here's the object you're hitting right now. That's what it's I like, it out to be. It's a, it's a, so uh, you're saying it's a, a targeting reticle to know you what what you're hitting right now yeah and to like identify what like say i'm gathering resources like wood brick and steel uh it, it's it's letting me know if like oh you're hitting this tree expect wood that's what i've learned from right 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 okay yeah that's a that's a common uh perception we see in our players mm -hmm. um what it actually is is a mechanic that's supposed to be kind of like active reload but for your harvesting mm -hmm. what you'll find out is if you aim for that spot as it appears and move it around you'll harvest much faster Oh, uh, and it makes a little noise to let you know that you've done it. So it's supposed to be kind of a, a mini game to harvesting. Oh, um, and that was originally designed go. in in the in the save the world in, environment. Yeah, um, where in save the world it actually unlocks later on in your progression. So it's not something you have right from the start. Because mm -hmm. what we did see is when it was there right from the start, people had a little bit of problem understanding it. Hmm. Uh, it is there right from the start in Fortnite Battle Royale, but it's not so important compared to. Um, save the world mm -hmm. uh, and in fact there are strategies around not using that because experienced players like to harvest trees all the way down to just one hit left raining and then walk away so the tree doesn't explode and give away their position oh <laughs> that is smart yeah uh huh uh that's really interesting i um 
So, uh, which I can I can make a question out of that. Uh-huh. So, as a UX researcher, I think it's interesting because, like, you know, you sort of go into the job like, like, uh, trying to make like uh, uh, decisions that benefit all players equally. But as game as communities grow and like sort of solidify, and you figure out who exactly is going to be sticking around playing your game. What kind of decisions do you have to factor in when you're looking at the broad range of people who are playing your game, and how you can like like support like your continue like your your very firm casual base versus your growing uh um you're growing you know, or like hopefully you know this increasing uh ca- excuse me you have the casual base and then you have the expert base that's still there sorry that's what right i'm trying to do all this at once and it's very hard yeah no worries uh yeah of course you have to look at both and that is um part of what we do in ux research often as i said we're, we're there to help the developers and kind of almost serve developers and making sure that their vision's coming across. And that means when we go to do research, we go to do a test, uh, we'll always be looking at what they want to know. So say they do want to know what the issues experienced players are having with a new mechanic or a new change, then we bring in experienced players and we look at experienced players or we survey experienced players, whatever the option is. It's all about finding the right methodology to answer the question. Uh, A lot of the time what we are looking at is uh, onboarding. and that can lead to interesting situations, right? Because um, when you add something to help a new player, sometimes the experienced player base is not sure why that was there or feel like uh, it's not something that's important. Uh, so for example, uh, something in Fortnite Battle Royale is uh, if you look on the far right of the screen, there's an icon that lets you know how to open your map. Mm-hmm. Um, that was recently added because we saw in, in test that new players were not working out how to open their map. So. Um, that kind of made the experience not so good for everybody because experienced players would be looking at their map, placing markers, that kind of thing, and inexperienced players wouldn't be, and the experienced players would be frustrated by them. Mm -hmm. But then when we added that marker, there was some feedback from the experienced community of why is this here, it takes up space, I don't like it, I already know how to open the map, who who can't work this out, this kind of thing. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, Just watching Brian play there, like I I think I mentioned I, I... I picked this up a couple months ago, spent some time with it, put it down, um, and I never got to the skill level where I was really building in any significant way. And just watching you, Brian, build that stairway to heaven as like a, an elevated firing platform on that target, and then watching the other person like throw up walls. This game is so, uh, it has such interesting depth um, in a way that I didn't really expect when it really first came out. How do you, like, Ben, has it been a significant challenge, and if so, how to like convey quickly and efficiently? or intuitively like how that whole building mechanic system works like to this to even now like watching brian use it i have a hard time telling like what buttons you have to press to get what walls up or how um how have you guys iterated on that right yeah uh, so the the building system came out of lots and lots of testing and oh my god i got a kill save the world. <laughs> yeah that was good congratulations oh my goodness <laughs> <sighs> Uh, so it went through a lot of iteration in Save the World and a lot of different uh, designs. And it was a very big focus in, in the Save the World side of things of, of making building intuitive and fun to do. And that's what led to this kind of component system you can see mm. at, at the moment in this, this game. And so we actually didn't have to do much work to get it uh, to be able to be understood in Battle Royale because it was already so good from Save the World, especially uh, over the last couple of years, it's really come together as, as the system that what we've actually found is that a lot of people learn um, from getting in the kind of situations that have just happened and seeing other people do it. Mm-hmm. Also, one of the strengths of, of Fortnite Battle Royale is it's got the spectator mode. When you die, you just start randomly spectating other people. Mm. And we found that new players actually pick up really fast from that as well. Uh, they see how people build, they see what tactics people are, are doing, and it really kind of uh, virally spreads uh, through the population. And that's right. both in Save the World and in, in Fortnite Battle Royale. So, for example, when we sometimes test Save the World and we're in a more isolated situation, not on a live server because uh, we're testing it in development mm-hmm. uh, thing, we see slower learning of building than we would see if we were testing people on a live environment where they can run into other people and learn from them. 
Oh, interesting. Um, there's kind of a question related to that here in chat. And just a reminder, everyone who's watching, um, this is a, a Q&A show, if you want it to be. So uh, if you write any good questions here in chat, we will do our best to pick them up and throw them out so Ben can answer them. Uh, there's a question here from Statistat. He asks, for your research, Ben, how do you get a representative sample of the player population while the game is still in development? Which I guess Statistat is suggesting there is like a, a perception that sometimes market research can be overly focused on young men in college rather than the overall population of a game. So how do you dial that in? Right. So, uh, I mean, one thing we... I, sh I should be clear about in terms of UX is we don't typically do market research. Mm. Uh, market research is a, can be a different set of skills and we have some different people that handle handle that. Um, what we're typically looking at is the user experience. Uh, in terms of user experience, uh, demographics can be slightly less important because it's more about fundamental uh, psychology and fundamental limitations of the human brain rather than necessarily how people uh, feel about something or or their subjective impressions or will they spend money that kind of thing which can be a little bit uh more variable mm -hmm. but in terms of how we how we recruit it is simply we maintain a database that is filled with a, a wide variety of people we put out a, a call if we want to bring people in uh, oh. and we'll be asking a bunch of screener questions to find out what kind of games they play. And that's how we recruit. We don't recruit uh, based on their age, uh, their gender, or, or anything like that. It's about, do they play the types of games we feel uh, are the types of games that are important there? Uh, do you happen to remember what the types of games were that you were looking to test against for this kind of stuff? Like, just off the top of your head? Uh... Yeah, sure. So the types of games we've looked at typically when um, testing Fortnite and uh, both Save the World and Battle Royale in general have been third-person games, first-person action games, and uh, particularly survival and uh, building type games like Minecraft or Rust or uh, mm. DayZ. But it can be very dependent on what the test is as well. Um, sometimes we, we've got a new mechanic and we really want to see how it does... Uh, with a very casual player and then we might bring in a very casual player um, yeah that makes a lot of sense i wonder um with a game like this which uh i believe is cross-platform right it's on pc and, and consoles brian's playing on ps4 right now um how does that that difference in platform that difference in input uh change your approach to to to, to like designing and implementing the ux and and sort of getting it to be in the right place like was it were there any significant differences between your work on the console version of this and the pc version or not at all uh, yeah, sure. Certainly in, in Save the World, um, where that was first developed, there was a lot of work there. Uh, for a long time, all the testing on, on Fortnite was PC because it was a, a PC title. Mm -hmm. And then when we looked to move to uh, console, it was a relatively simple change to just start bringing people in and everybody uses a controller rather than everybody uses a, a, a mouse and keyboard. And actually at the point we're at now, where we're relatively comfortable uh, with the controls and how things work, unless we have a specific research question that's related to control, we typically just let people play on whatever control uh, layout they feel is most comfortable. Uh, it's so interesting because it seems like, especially with all the uh, stuff you can build and place, and, and like it seems like uh, getting that to, f to flow well or to be satisfying on a controller versus a mouse and keyboard would seem to be like a huge challenge, but uh, it sounds like people just sort of figured it out. Yeah, I mean, the, the game's gone through a, a couple of uh, control changes. For example, mm -hmm. the, the Combat Pro controls is now what's used in uh, Fortnite Battle Royale, and there's no version of that in Save the World at the moment. Uh, so there is actually some control difference between the two games right now. But when the controls were being worked on, we actually did quite a lot of iterative uh, UX testing around them and gave feedback on them to try and get them to the place they're in now where things are relatively quick mm -hmm. and, and easy to do. And the team really... Uh, knocked it out considering it was done in a relatively compressed uh, time period. Uh, yeah. Flo Polly in chat would like to know, um, Ben, what's your advice for anyone who wants to uh, get a job doing the kind of work you do? What is this? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> How do you break into the game industry, Ben? <laughs> How do I break into the game <laughs> industry? Not, not even necessarily the game industry, just UX in right. general. Right. Yeah, yeah, UX in general. Uh, so user experience... Um, there are specific courses in it now that you can do it at various uh, universities or uh, around the place. I'm just, I'm just interested. Are you 
aware that you dropped your scar just then? Yeah, well, I have this scar. Okay. Brian and, has yeah, yeah, that was very deliberate. <laughs> okay. Um, I hope that was an okay decision. No, it was an okay decision. I'm just curious if, if it was intentional or not. Yeah, we're just um, Sorry, I'm just always watching for these things. Uh, uh, so, oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Wait. You can not You can do specific courses in it right now, which was not a thing when I was uh, getting my education. Yeah. yeah. But uh, generally speaking, what we look for in uh, someone in user experience uh, research in particular is typically a background in psychology or in human computer interaction uh, or a similar field. There's some people that with soci uh, sociology or anthropology backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And unlike some of the areas of game design, it, that your education does typically um, matter. It is most people would at least have a bachelor's working in this area because it's important to understand uh, research methodologies and what, what is appropriate and what is not and understand how to get good data. Uh, it used to be that most people working in the industry had PhDs, like myself. Now that's no longer uh, necessarily a requirement. Um, ah. But it, <laughs> <laughs> Lucky, in sorry. terms of getting into it, uh, there's actually a group, I'm, I'm the chair of it this year, called the uh, Games User Research SIG of the IGDA. Mm. Uh, you can sign up and join that on uh, LinkedIn. We also have a Discord, and we have a, a, two summits every year, one in the US and one in the EU. Summit's actually coming up in two weeks' time alongside GDC. Mm. Uh, and that's a great group to join to make contacts. It's basically got uh, user researchers and UX people from across the industry uh, that are actively engaged, asking questions. We run a mentoring program. We have a careers board. Uh, and we do a lot of work around the area of, of outreach and recruitment because every company always has issues when it comes to trying to find people that are qualified in this area right on. yeah um i wonder real quick if we could just like dig into your own um background you know before coming to work uh at epic and everything like you have had a a long career in this um and you spent quite a lot of time in school how did you end up uh, deciding, uh, hitting on the idea of UX design and research as your passion, and how did you end up uh, bringing that into the games industry? Right, okay. Yeah, uh, that's a longish story. Um, <laughs> my undergraduate degree was actually originally in biology. I wanted to be a zookeeper, and I was a zookeeper for a year. What? Um, Wait, alright, hang on. Sorry. Um, <laughs> that's all you were, what, what zoo? Where did you work? <laughs> uh, so I worked at uh, Hamilton Zoo in uh, Hamilton in New Zealand, where I'm from. Hmm. Um, I was a mammal keeper there for a year, so I looked after white rhino and uh, lemurs and, and things like that. It was it was lovely. Wow. Um, uh, have you applied any of that experience to your work uh, in game development? Oh uh, yeah, sure. Actually, a lot of uh, behavioral psychology stuff that applies there also applies in, in game development. Mm. Yeah, sure. I think we all know a white rhino. Uh, that white rhino at the office. Uh, you just uh -huh. gotta learn to, <laughs> you gotta yeah. learn to work alongside them. Um, they so don't have you... good vision. You've got to make sure they hear you coming. Yeah, absolutely. I know some people like that. Uh, so, how did you end up going from the zoo to a PhD in uh, in UX? Yeah. So my undergraduate uh, degree was in animal behavior, and as part of that, I had to take some psychology courses. Mm. I took one uh, called uh, Cognitive Psychology. The professor of that, um, Samuel Charlton, was a very uh, enthusiastic, he's a very enthusiastic guy, and he was very passionate about human factor psychology. Mm. Um, and that was enough for me to decide that that's actually what I wanted to do. Uh, I wanted to leave biology behind and move into psychology. So I, I pursued that. I did my master's in traffic psychology. Um, but at that time, Games user research wasn't really a thing, but after my master's, I, I kind of stumbled upon it online. In fact, um, I was thinking of doing an article on Gama Sutra, writing about behavioral game design, and I checked, sure. and I checked, and uh, John Hobson, who who is now at Blizzard, previously of Bungie and Microsoft, had already written it, mm. and that's what opened my eyes to that the success. He was already working in the industry. Um, and I reached out and contacted a few people. I started to get involved in that group that I mentioned previously, the, the Gersig. Mm -hmm. um, and at that time, it was still very much uh, the feedback I was getting is come back once you have a PhD. <laughs> um, so sure. I did it. <laughs> I did a PhD. Uh, it wasn't in anything related to games. Again, it was in traffic psychology. But during that time, it was always uh, on my mind of 
Uh, traffic was something I'm also passionate about, but there's this thing I could be doing on the side. So I, I wrote several articles for Gamma Sutra about it while I was doing my PhD. I taught at a, a local university in the Netherlands where I was doing my PhD. Uh, I taught game design students there about uh, playtesting and methodology. And then uh, from there, I was able to kind of get a foot in the door and get into industry in my first position in the UK at, at Player Research. Mm. Yeah, it does seem like talking to a lot of devs and, and folks who are dev adjacent, like, uh, you know, the, we see a lot of questions in streams like this are so often focused not only on fellow devs, but on hobbyists and students. Like, how do you get into the industry? And the answer always seems to be either A, have shipped a game already, uh, which uh, is tricky, or um, just, you know, go do something relevant to that academic academia and then also blog on the side or organize things on the side or do some kind of research on the side that establishes a value that you can then cite when you go to work somewhere. Um, so that is uh, fascinating, and I, I would love to... <laughs> All right, so I'm just going to take a second, because I meant to ask about this in the beginning, and I didn't, and I feel yeah. like we have to now, because Brian is wailing on so many things. There is an effect when the player hits something, whether it's uh, a fridge or a rock or anything else. Yeah. Everything kind of wobbles. Um, can you just tell me how that wobble came to be, if you know? Because that seems to be... Like really critical to understanding when you're hitting something yeah but uh it's very uh subtle yeah so uh unfortunately that wobble predates me but mm. it is one of those aspects that I, and there's a lot of these aspects in fortnite of giving this nice rich feedback environment to the players that we feel really makes the game super accessible like uh, we think one of the strengths of fortnite and fortnite battle royale is you can just jump into this game and very quickly work out what's happening and it's not just you know the wobble on the wall when you're hitting things is great feedback, but you know when you're near a chest, the gl glowing gold, and you can hear them uh, through the ceiling or through the wall that you're near one of them. When these, when this opens up, it highlights when you're over it, right? And there's a clear prompt and call to action of, of what to do. Mm. And this came across during Save the World during a, a lot of iteration process. But unfortunately, I, I wasn't there for the the wobble. It is very cool though. <laughs> Gotcha. It's cool. It's it's a good wobble. Uh, someone in chat is real quick asking, "Can you say again the name of the two discords that you mentioned a minute ago?" Which I have already they've already slipped out of my mind, but they'd like to look them up if they're uh, right. interested in getting in touch. So it's uh, what we want to look for is the game user research uh, sig of the IGDA. We have a we have a website. I think it's gamesuserresearchsig.org. And from there, there will be information on how to join the LinkedIn group. You can also search for us on LinkedIn and also how to join our Discord group. Nice. Right on. Ben, to, to move our conversation along from, from career things to other elements of UX, um, something I've been talking to a lot of designers about when they come on this show and we're playing online games or live games is there's a big discussion these days about... Um, ethical UX practices, ethical practices in designing monetization features, like uh, like there's a fine line between what is pleasant and what is addictive in game de uh, design. Um, uh, do I need to build a way down? Um, I'm curious, like, what have been some of your guiding principles in your work to try and make... Uh, um, trying to figure out the rotate button. There we go. Um, uh, to try and make like experiences that are good for your players but won't like harm them in some way, um, and also like how you feel about um, if you have any feelings about how certain systems like in games will rely on like very pleasant feeling things like the treasure chest you mentioned like they're very hard like those are obviously harmless in this mode because it's just like here's an alert that'll point you to something but like the sound of an opening chest is what hooks people into loot boxes sort of if you get my drift. Mm -hmm. Uh. From my perspective on that as a, as a UX professional, uh, the goal always should be from our perspective, and certainly this is how um, myself and my team um, approaches this, is to report back what the players are telling us. So if the players are telling us or we're seeing as part of their behavior that a certain approach to monetization or a certain uh, way of, of dealing with the situation is something that is distressing to them or uh, error-prone or uh, deceptive, then we will report that. Mm -hmm. um, the practice of, of dark patterns is, is typically what it's called in uh, UX, mm -hmm. where you use uh, user experience knowledge to encourage behavior that the player wouldn't necessarily want to do, is not something I personally endorse or encourage. Um, it's not something that you see 
as common in games as you see it in web where it's mm. incredibly common um as part of uh ux design but it is generally something that is talked about a lot in the ux industry and typically talked about very disapprovingly uh within uh the circles that that we move in mm-hmm. um yeah, all I can think about is like uh, uh, Facebook and Instagram and the way those are like specifically structured to to keep to give you reasons to keep interacting with them, even if they're not things that make you satisfied or happy. Yeah, uh, um, but, or or uh, one of my the nasty tricks is um, I've seen on Facebook that people are putting like fake hairs on their ads or whatever to make people try and brush it away and click the ad. Oh, that's uh, such a good idea. That's so dark. Thanks, mm. Alex. Um, so, uh, yeah, something also that I, I sort of want to dig into because, uh, you know, we, we talk around about, you know, your, your involvement in a project like this and how all the small ways that you end up, um, trying to make it a more satisfying and challenging, enjoyable experience. Um, you know, now that you've spent some time on stuff like this and, and you've done, you had some experience writing about this and, and working with the SIG and stuff, um, as game developers come to appreciate the value of of UX specialists in in design and development even more, like what if, if there was one thing you've seen that you wish you could tell all developers to just like don't do this. This is this doesn't this doesn't work the way you think it does. It's a bad move. Try to avoid this. Like what would it be? Is there one thing that really drives you nuts? If not, I'm trying to think about that. Um, I mean. The- Games is, are so variable; it's hard to come up with with just one thing. Mm. Um, what can be a, a, a common uh, a common thing I can sometimes see, see from developers that can be a little bit uh, frustrating is that perception that UX or that uh, usability work is all about uh, making things easier and smoothing off all the edges and holding people's hands and and all that kind of thing. And certainly, that can be an outcome of UX if that's what the developer intends. But UX should never be prescriptive. It, it should just be there as a as an extra tool. And it would be nice if. And it has changed over time. Um, but sometimes, when when you tell a developer that you work in UX research or you work uh, in UX, it, it can be a reaction of you're kind of the bad guy that will come in and hit them with sticks. Um, well, which you know, you, do you hit people with sticks? No. Uh, <laughs> not generally. We, not generally. Uh, in fact, we do always um, make an effort when we're reporting back uh, to the developers within Epic and also in my previous uh, positions to developers in general is to always lead off and talk about what worked well. Um, that needs to be part of the development process. It, often when people talk about UX uh, publicly, they only ever talk about bad UX and, and things that went uh, poorly. And that's because bad UX stands out but there's a saying in usability that usability is like air. You only notice it when it's gone. And we also need to be able to be calling out, hey, this is really good. This change worked. People are really getting this. And that's that's another important part of the position. Mm-hmm. Can you think of an example of that uh, in your recent work? Is there some time when you... Uh you didn't just like find something that needed to be improved or tweaked or removed. You found something that needed to be emphasized that needed to be celebrated and like lifted up uh, as an already positive experience. Yeah. I mean, uh, every, every report that we do, we usually have some positives in there because something's changed about the game that has been effective. Hmm. And certainly the first uh, studies we did of battle Royale mode, were very positive because a lot of the uh, UX that had been successful and saved the world was uh, transplanted into uh, Battle Royale. So it was, you know, people get how to harvest things. People get that the world is destructible because there's this nice wiggle on things when you when you hit them. Just mm. very appealing to people. They attract people. You see people running towards those glows. All these things, they sound common sense. They sound obvious to point out, but we do think it's important to be mentioned. Yeah, right on. There are very cute names. I like the cute names: Twisty Towers, Faulty Flats, whatever they're called. Retail I, uh, Row. Retail, retail Row. row. Yeah. 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 We the the um, the team really likes to make sure that that carries across, and that was definitely something that saved the world. Established and has been carried into Battle Royale. Like even our loading screen tips are, are sometimes things like uh, if you fall, you take damage, so don't fall. 
things like that. You know? Yeah, there's a certain like cheeky tone to it that I appreciate. It sets it apart in a lot of ways from some of the competitors. I um, um, I would just say a quick comparison to uh, Player Notes Battlegrounds, which I hope no one shoots me for mentioning while playing Fortnite. Um, my my immediate observation is that Salty Springs, all those names are a lot easier to remember than. Uh, the town names in uh, in player knowns battlegrounds because those are often in foreign languages or at least they're foreign to me because I am a uh, idiot right. American. Um, oh, so. well, see, that's why. But, it's but they're so... also like they're also yeah. like emotive names, and we remember emotive names better than we remember just generic ones because they make yeah. us think about something. They make us form some kind of um, like connection with it, whether yeah. it's yeah. funny or, or whatever it is. Although I have to say, like you know. Uh, uh, something like, like PUBG, which uh, you know doesn't have these sort of memorable, cute names, uh, has its own unique and very uh, appealing way of establishing names because the the player communities in different regions establish their own names, and that's super neat too. Like uh, uh, you know, like like weird names like uh, like wizard, what are they called, wizard huts or whatever for the towers and stuff in that game. I think that's that's not better or worse, but equally interesting. The idea that you would have these sort of like vaguely named places that then the communities will then come up with their own nomenclature for. Um, so real quick, before we move on, uh, Ben, a minute ago, you, you pointed out that like it's a common misconception that UX researchers are just there to make everything be streamlined and feel good. Uh, I had that misconception. Uh, I'm an outsider. I don't make games. And so I also have this, this uh, perception that UX is typically um, backloaded. Like, it's not really so much at the front of development, it's near the end when you're doing QA, when you're sort of polishing everything and tweaking everything. Um, I'm guessing that's probably wrong. Can you tell me, you know, where, where UX comes in and, you know, uh, how how you work on a project from start to finish? Right. Yeah. Uh, ideally, UX is, is involved through the entire development process, but this mm -hmm. can be very dependent on the studio and the demands and the speed at, at things run at. But UX can be enrolled involved right at the conception stage where you've got paper prototypes or digital prototypes and in fact it's very useful to get uh, UX involved at that point because not a lot of time and effort has been invested into something um, so regularly we're testing just uh, basically bring players in and they sit in front of a PowerPoint slide with some uh, mocked up UI on screen and we move through it we ask them questions and we make sure that they can point on the screen and say where they'd click or what the message of the screen is telling them mm. and that's very cheap compared to actually programming it and, and waiting until the last minute to test it and then finding out that it, something needs to change like just before a build rolls, rolls out um, from the other angle UX is also very involved post launch um, of course our game's early access so it's continuing to go on uh, in development but UX process continues there as well and even in games that are uh, fully launched often the ux process continues in terms of running surveys or looking at future updates mm. especially with games as a service nowadays but yeah i i guess the short question the short answer is like ux can be involved at every stage and we like to be involved at every stage it's not necessarily the reality because of how quickly game development moves right i did not know there was a house on this island this is huge yeah uh there's a question in chat that we've basically been talking around for the last half hour, but I'm just going to ask it directly. Flo Polly asks, Ben, what was your biggest challenge as a UX researcher for Fortnite? For Fortnite? Uh, let's no see. pressure. <laughs> Brian, get that juice. Nope. I got the juice. <laughs> yeah. So I think I'm trying to, there's someone who landed on this island with me. I'm trying to lure them into my... You want to get them in the trap downstairs? Yeah. Do you... Is this your uh, trap house? Uh -huh. <laughs> Get up. Mm. Uh, the biggest challenge for us with Fortnite at the moment, especially Fortnite uh, Battle Royale, but also Save the World, is as we're ramping up um, <laughs> production on the game, uh, it's important for us to be able to test and get feedback to uh, the developers fast enough. Mm. And that's kind of uh, always a challenge in games user research because the pace development is, is very quick. Um, that if we're not testing and getting feedback quickly, then the game may have already changed or things may have been committed to uh, already. Mm -hmm. So typically speaking, uh, at least for us, uh, our turnaround is very quick. So we might get players in, uh, test them for a day, and then we have a report out with videos and, and screenshots and all that kind of stuff within two days afterwards. And that can be a, an up to 80 page report depending on it we, we've had some go over 100 we try and avoid that but wow uh, that was in 
in extreme circumstances. <laughs> that um, that seems like a hard sell if you're gonna if you're gonna talk to a lead or something or a team and you're gonna say, hey, we have some suggestions for how we can change it for next week's you know build or whatever. Here's a hundred page report. Here's here's like do do you do you end up like do you end up giving presentations internally? Do you like give out a bullet point list or do you just send that around and and be thankful that people read it? Right. Yeah, th- I mean the hundred page report is is very rare. We try and not do that. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it is that is a challenge as well. Is uh, kind of as its nature, research produces a lot of data, mm-hmm. um, and how to present that. So we we take several approaches to that. One is we will do a summary at the start that very clearly calls out what we think the highest priorities are. We've established uh, practices of sometimes. Uh, maintaining lists of what we feel like here's the top five issues if you're going to look at nothing else uh, these are the the five that we should talk about mm. and uh we go through the jira process where uh, our ux issues are entered kind of like bugs are from from qa so they are assigned to different people so they get in front of people and as you mentioned with the presentations we uh, generally try and have a meeting uh with leads and and decision makers on the team to go over the report take the time to step through it and discuss like is this something we should be caring about or not? Because that is another part of UX is we may see a player do something and we will literally write in the report like, is this a problem? We're not sure. We saw the player do it. Uh, you, yeah. t- you tell us if you didn't want players doing this. And sometimes the developers will say, nope, that's exactly what we wanted. Not a problem at all. Did you want them leaving their scar under the stairs? Is that a yeah. viable strategy? Sure. <laughs> Um, so, you know, uh, pursuant to that, this idea of like uh, the, the challenge being to, to integrate yourself and be useful um, and provide feedback fast enough to be able to make meaningful changes. Uh, is there like something, is there a way you'd like to see, and I know you haven't, you obviously haven't worked everywhere, you've, you know, who knows how different studios work, but is there something you'd like to see changed in the way games have developed uh, both pre and post release that would like sort of facilitate the work of, of UX specialists in a better way? Is there some process change that the way games are made now that might be sort of tweaked to give folks like you more room to work i think it just goes back to what i was talking about before and this is a change that is happening which is making sure that uh if you have ux people working with you that you get them uh involved early it can be really scary to let your uh baby go when you know it's not ready and it can be very natural for developers to say oh yeah i know it's going to have lots of issues because this this and this is not in yet yeah. Um, but there is value in even just getting the feedback that you're right, that there was going to be a lot of issues, or, hey, maybe something's not a problem at all that you thought was going to be a problem. Mm. I wonder, um, is there a specific example of a, of a, a feature or a UI element or something that uh, that you sort of went through a process like this on? Like, maybe not, you know, the primary... F- focus of the 100 page report but is there like a specific thing that you had to work through and iterate on with the team that would have benefited from just like a, a faster cycle or a different way of working something like that uh, nothing I can specifically call out in terms of that process uh, in terms of like what would have been nice to have more time on Yeah, is that what you're calling out yeah. uh, nothing I can specifically call out there oh well we, uh, we, look, for, we look for really specific examples because I know um you know, every game is totally different and a, a unique beast. But there's always, it always feels like there's one thing where you talk to somebody and they go, "Oh God, I wish I'd had a little more time to do this, or a little time to to, or if I'd started from the beginning, I would have done this differently." I was just talking to a developer, uh, or editing a story about a developer who like they had just set out their hitbox system and they wished that they just started from the beginning that they they'd rewritten it so that they could sub in like uh, different weapons for characters and stuff much more easily. Um, but oh, anyway, uh, so I wonder. You know, as, as we sort of wrap this up, and folks in chat, like we have about ten more minutes left, so or fifteen minutes. So get your questions in. Get your questions. Yeah, yeah. You, you, we we want your questions, but you have a little time. All right. Well, then, actually, yeah. uh, we we won't wrap this up yet. Uh, instead, we're gonna we're gonna field a question from Hudelf, who wants to know, Ben, how do you handle getting mixed feedback on a suggested change, where some players like the change and other players prefer the old experience? Right. Um. Is there any change where you don't get mixed feedback? <laughs> yeah, there can be changes for sure that get very, uh, very like, yeah, this was positive. For example, the, the change to building that's gone into Fortnite Battle Royale recently where um, if you were to put down a, a, a wall or a ramp right now, it would go into that camper van rather than being blocked by that camper, camper van. Mm-hmm. Hmm. That's 
by and large, as far as we can tell, uh, received nearly completely positive feedback. There's not a lot of negatives around it. Wow. When something is um, mixed or actually uh, very divided, and we have evidence that that's the case from, say, large sales surveys or something like that, we we will report that. And then it's very much up to having this discussion with the developers about how they feel about that data. Um, one of the th important things with UX data is we listen to players, but we don't necessarily listen to their solutions or why they think a problem is occurring. Mm -hmm. What we try and understand is what the underlying uh, game situation that is leading to that feedback is. So they might be saying something's overpowered uh, and calling out a specific weapon, but maybe it's something to do actually with how aiming works or uh, how the damage model works or how the hitboxes are, and it's got nothing to do with that specific weapon. Mm. Right yeah, that's that's fascinating. We hear that all the time. Um, ben, uh, I'm curious. Like you've been doing UX research for a while. It's really cool that you now get to be like a lead at Epic. How do you feel uh, players have changed over your over your career? Because you've been able to gather a lot of data over on a lot of different subjects. And I'm curious what changes you've noticed in the people playing your games has been. Uh, so. One of the interesting trends, I guess, that I've been noticing is that, at least in, in certain markets, there has been a move towards um, mobile gaming as a more serious, um, less, I guess, viewed as casual or, or negative uh, mm -hmm. thing to be doing, especially in the in the Asian markets. It can mm -hmm. be very um, hardcore type games. In fact, a lot of games that, I guess, if it was a few years ago, would say that would never work on mobile, have been right. successful in those markets. Another... Um, change that i'm not 100 percent sure on this but there does and this could be linked to the work that uh bungie did on destiny mm -hmm. is there is it seems like a more uh base understanding of progression systems and kind of rpg systems amongst a shooter crowd that there was before mm -hmm. although uh for example the colors in uh fortnite battle royale for the loot and save the world are relatively standard colors Across the industry for rarity has mm -hmm. become relatively um, well established through mobile games uh, through other games but it can still be an issue for some new players to learn those colors but it, it's a little bit better than it was yeah i was just thinking about this recently like this weekend about how uh you know there's a bunch of news about how battle royale is like blowing up in a big way for fortnite and uh, i was thinking like these kind of systems a couple years ago would have been anathema to somebody designing a first person game but then also monster hunter world which is um traditionally a series that is seen to be overly complex and and you know very intricate um is huge uh in part i think because people have become more accustomed to playing like systems rich um uh, sort of uh, 3D experiences, uh, right? And it's was... because UX UX has moved forward on those systems. Like, yeah, uh, the the folks at Bungie spent a long, long time trying to get Destiny to play for their their Halo and their and their Call of Duty audience, who in very early days just weren't weren't connecting at all. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, sorry about the traffic noises. If anyone else, no, no worries. Noise. I don't know where it coming oh, from. Oh, sorry. But, uh, that's uh, my mic must be really good now. I, no. I fixed my mic, guys. I got a better mic, and now it would appear that this is the exact time that the lawnmowers outside get going. Uh, oh. If it's a bother, let me know. I will. I will meet myself. No, it's good, and uh, I want to forge ahead because we do actually have ten minutes now. And yeah. when I put out that call, a lot of good questions came in. You guys are doing our job for us. So uh, let's see here. Snut one hundred and one wants to know, Ben, have you done any UX work on the Unreal Editor? And if you have, how does it compare to your work on a game like Fortnite? Uh, yeah, we do work on uh, Unreal Engine as well. We work on every product that um, Epic puts out. Mm -hmm. um, we're not just limited to the games. Working with the editor and the engine is a little bit um, more complicated than working with, with the games. Uh, in that that? It, it, it can be hard to get the right people in. With, with the games, it's relatively easy to get people to come in and sit down in front of it and uh, go through scenarios and, and play a game. With uh, Unreal Engine, uh, you need to have a little bit more of a base knowledge. So that can be one challenge there. Um, also, compared to working with games when we are working with the Unreal Engine or, for example, Epic's website or, or whatever we might be looking at, then the, the goal there is usually to take all the edges off and to smooth the experience. So it's 
it can be a different process than uh, when we're looking at a game. Certainly mm -hmm. in terms of how we report back and the type of thing we might call out as an issue. I'm just curious, because um, we write for a lot of devs that use UE, um, when you came onto the project, did you get the sense that there had been significant thought put into the UX of the editor before you arrived, or was it sort of your sort of your baby as you came on was to sort of start applying your UX learnings to the way this engine works? Uh, it certainly predates me, the, the mm. UX work on the engine, uh, but UX at Epic is still relatively uh, new compared to other studios, so uh, we recognize that there's more work that could be done. Hmm. Uh, okay, so let's see. I got some folks saying goodbye. Thank you so much. We have a question here from Game Dev Company that says, uh, Ben, what are the goals for when you start doing your UX study? We touched on this a little earlier, but let's get specific. They asked, do you have specific goals? For example, are you trying to sort of help people build more or help them move around in a different way? Um, or do you just go in sort of listening? So uh, our goals are very much um, kind of set by the, the developers. Hmm. So what will do generally happen is in a meeting or over email or, or however it is, we'll have a discussion with a developer and they'll call out something that they're interested to know about, whether it's a new mechanic or a concern that they've seen uh, raised by the community or whatever it might be. We'll then have a discussion with them about what the best research method to get that answered is, hmm. what to go forward with, and then that's how we approach it. So sometimes we will go in with a, a, a very set goal uh, in the past, say when they were working on shooting in, in Fortnite Save the World, they even just had like um, shooting ranges that the players played in. It wasn't even uh, a world you could run around in and just had husks running towards the player and, and tune the model that way. Hmm. Uh, or uh, in other cases, we have in the past run four-day tests of Fortnite Save the World. So we can see with the same players coming in every single day, we can see hey, if they learn this on day one, is on day four a better experience? Or if they miss this on day one, is day four a worse experience? That kind of thing. Mm. Which can yeah, be that's... way broader. Yeah, totally. That sounds uh, that sounds complex. Um, just rapid fire here. Ellie just D asks, do you have other UX techniques well, besides tests? For example, do you use questionnaires or like analytics and data that does not necessarily involve players playing and then telling you what they thought? Sure. So in, in tests, it's players playing and us watching what they do. That's the most important thing. It's not necessarily what they tell us. It's behavioral observation of what they actually do uh, is the data we're after. Uh, we certainly use analytics. There is an analytics department at um, Epic that we work closely with. Uh, and we have a, a data person on our team that also looks into that. Uh, the other approaches that we typically use are surveys. We do very large-scale surveys of our, our player population and analyze those and often do try to match them back to real data as well so we can break down, like, what are the views of people that play a lot versus what are the views of the new players or the people that haven't played for a while. Uh, and we also do uh, expert analysis, which is, say, there's not enough time uh, to bring people in or do a survey, mm. then uh, the team, the UX team will look at it and say, okay, based on past UX tests, our knowledge of testing other games and um, psychological principles, here's the things that could go wrong uh, and and give that off to the developers as well. Right on. Um, on the tack of like other games and, and sort of looking at what's going on in the industry, uh, there's a good question here. Uh, Chicky Chicky Bri Bri asks, uh, what non-epic games have some of your favorite user experiences? Are there other games that inspire you when you're looking specifically at UX? I guess that does also, I'll answer that, but uh, it does also remind me of another methodology we use, which is yeah. competi uh, c competitive analysis, which is we'll play other games and we'll write what they do well in terms mm. of UX and what they do uh, poorly in terms of UX. Uh, for me, uh, I've kind of mentioned already I'm I'm a fan of Destiny and, and the work that they did there. They really made an experience that is um, matches a shooter and a, a role-playing game together and they have a fantastic game feel like when you fire their guns in, in that game it really feels like you're um, immersed in and making an impact in the world. Mm. Yeah, and something as small as like the uh, the cursor they use to navigate menus in that game, like it really threw me off at first. But after a while, you get so comfortable with it, it feels like 
you know, on a mouse it works, but then also on a gamepad, it feels like you're not so much moving a mouse cursor as you're sort of rolling a ball around this field, and that comes to feel very satisfying in a way that I did not anticipate when I first was like, what is this weird uh, weighted cursor thing they're doing? This, uh, what is this weird shooter? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> uh, let's see. We yeah, got when four. I when I first yeah. loaded it up and saw the the mouse cursor on console, I was like, "Whoa!" Like everybody says, you shouldn't do that, and but they did it, and it works well. Yeah, and I I did not have any faith, but it totally worked out. Um, there's uh, probably more questions here that we're gonna have time for. We're running out of time, but Ben uh, Kari with about thirty two eyes asks, "How have games as a service changed the way you look at UX, other than?" The frequency with which you do testing. The uh, key thing, the key thing with games as a service is it's really focused UX, and it's partly um, maybe why I would say there has been a rise in UX because with games as a service, retention becomes really, really important. Uh, a game where it's an uh, upfront front price and you don't necessarily want your players uh, playing it for a long period of time, or it doesn't matter if they don't, then um, Retention doesn't matter quite as much, especially if the game's free. Retention matters a lot, and games as a service, you want them to keep on playing. And catching UX issues can really impact retention. So that's the biggest area I've seen change is a lot of UX is very focused on, hey, this problem is going to cause people to quit your game immediately within the first minute, and they have not paid anything for it, so they've got no problem doing that. Mm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, we definitely do have to close this out, Brian. You're killing it out there. Can I just can I just close I'm it out? I'm getting killed. One? Maybe maybe I can finish this guy off. Oh, oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. nice. Uh, so th- since this is sort of tangentially related to your talk at GDC later this month, Ben, I thought it would be good to close it out with a question from Denny Rocket about another one of your GDC talks. Uh, ben, Denny recently watched your GDC talk about dopamine shots and how they relate to game design. Is there anything you've learned since that talk that you perhaps applied to your work in Fortnite? Anything I've learned since that talk? Yeah. That was uh, like two years ago? Less? More? Yeah, it was last, it was last year. Oh, gosh. Um, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no worries. It was a long uh, year. I've learned that people on the internet think that I'm responsible for loot boxes and everything that's wrong with the gaming industry that's what i've learned Mm. yeah that sucks fair (laughs) (laughs) yeah i mean we could do another hour right on just that just like what happened to loot boxes last year and how the conversation suddenly caught up in a way that i thought was uh, very quick (laughs) yeah uh the ground kind of fell under a few people there that's for sure yeah uh Um, yeah but uh, i I mean uh, for a more serious reply to that i guess is uh, a lot of the stuff um in that talk it is kind of established principles and i'm, I'm not necessarily uh, would be willing to say there's anything uh, new that i've learned but i think that um feedback from people seeing that talk has been really valuable in terms of shaping how i communicate uh, the ideas there within the epic and and in other situations as well hmm. man uh would you say that you were doing user research on your own talk yeah Wow. style uh that's quite a profound way to end this stream um thank you alex for taking the lead on the questions as i struggle to survive in fortnite battle royale uh thank you to everyone tuning in for asking such great questions today we really appreciate it uh we as always here on the gamma sutra twitch channel are interested in the art and business of making games so when you're interested in that business uh it all works out really great um uh, we would like to disclo- remind everyone today that uh, UBM uh, is the, the, the owner, the, 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 the parent overseer, company. the parent yeah. company of the uh, Gama Sutra Twitch channel, uh, or of the Gama Sutra channel, of Gama Sutra and UBM. Um, Gama Sutra and GDC, I should say. Sorry. Uh, trying to keep my words focused as I loot these minds. Um, uh, and because of that, when we're talking about uh, Ben's GDC talk, we just want to remind you all that, uh, you know, it's a disclosure thing. Like, when we're talking about uh, that talk, we're talking about our sibling organization who benefits from our mentioning it. So yep. that's out there. Uh, if you want to know more about Ben's talk, there's a link to it down below. Just scroll down and click uh, more, see Ben's talk at GDC. Um, and with that, uh, if you're at GDC... Uh, hopefully you go if not it will wind up on the gdc vault and for us we would really appreciate it if you were to uh click on the follow button for gamma sutra 
because if you do follow this Twitch channel, you will get updates on when we are live uh, and when we are uh, talking to more developers like Ben. Uh, ben, is there anywhere you'd like uh, people to go if they have more questions for you? Sure, the easiest way to reach out with questions for me is probably via my Twitter at uh, ikbenben, which is I-K-Ben-Ben. It's, yeah. uh, it, it's Dutch for I am Ben. I thought mm -hmm. it was cute. It's cute. It's very cute. <laughs> right, I we're like just it. Gonna, we're just going to watch the VC Gamer 32 as they get all my sweet loot. They're I can't clearly... believe you didn't steal that pink car. That pink car looks so choice. I can't steal cars, Alex. Oh, you can't drive cars in this game? No. I, I always die before I, I assumed you could just drive the cars. Yes. I just wasn't good enough. <laughs> jump into the water. Mm. This person doesn't know we're watching. This person doesn't know we're streaming. This is fascinating. Let's just observe. Mm -hmm. But as much as I love to continue observing and streaming the exploits of VC Gamer Thirty Two, oh, that's what they were up to. They really wanted this. Oh, this is really useful. I, sh I should do this more. Yeah. yeah, they wanted the supply drop. That's what they're after. Yeah, mm -hmm. VC Gamer Thirty Two, we salute you. Everyone in Twitch, we salute you. Um, uh, thank you all so much for coming, and have a nice day. Bye. Bye. Bye.